Today I want to talk about two of my favorite gear types, actually the worm gear, which is what you see right here. The whole unit is usually referred to as a worm drive. This is just the motor mounted on the worm drive. We're going to take a look at the planetary gear, which actually I guess that makes it three gears. And I also want to talk about the strain wave gear, better known as a harmonic drive. Harmonic drive is the brand name, strain wave gear is the type of gear. We're going to talk about pros and cons, when you might use one or the other, and their, their various applications. I'll also talk about how the strain wave gear works. This video is part of a longer series on how gears work, all the various gear types. So if you want to go back and watch the whole series, I'll put a link in the description for you. In the meantime, let's start with the worm drive. So I pulled out a few examples of worm drives for you. This is a relatively small one here, and I don't remember the gear ratio on this one, but this one is rated for a little less than half horsepower as 0.39, I'll put the label on the screen for you. I just wanted you to get a sense of the size relative to the gear reduction, because this is a 40 to one gear reduction. And that brings me to point number one, which is there. They're really compact for the amount of speed reduction that you can get. And remember, as you reduce your speed, you are increasing the torque by that same amount. I went ahead and hooked this up to power so that I can show you how it works. One of the reasons we get so much speed reduction with the worm drive is because one full rotation of the worm down here at the bottom moves the driven gear by just one tooth. This one back here behind me is 1.8, 1.9 horsepower, and that's also a one horsepower motor mounted on it. One horsepower is about roughly 750 watts to give you a sense of scale there. These worm drives are not back drivable, so you can only drive the worm. You can't drive the output gear. That's usually considered a pro if you have machinery that you don't want to uh, back drive to your motor, this would be a good application for that. But if you wanted to use this to increase the speed, you couldn't do that because there, it's not designed to run the other way. Another factor related to speed is noise. And this is one of the highlights of using the worm drive. These guys are super quiet. Just like every gear type we're gonna be talking about, there are definitely some drawbacks. And one of the major drawbacks for this particular type is efficiency. They're pretty inefficient. There's a lot of energy wasted in friction from the worm you push against the uh, long axis of the shaft or in this direction, which is why we have this thrust style bearing, because if you didn't have that, all of the force would be pushing on this plate to push the shaft out of the box. So there's some wasted energy there, which also means that things like lubrication is really important. This whole box is usually full of oil. I've just drained it so that I can show you the inside. And something I talked about in the first video, and that is the input shaft is usually noticeably smaller than the output shaft. Because you have significantly more torque on the output shaft, that shaft needs to be larger just to withstand the additional twisting force that uh, comes with the higher torque. So that's something to pay attention to when you're designing your machines. Don't assume that these shafts are the same size, they're usually not. You can also get them in many different configurations. For example, this one has a receiver. It's not a, a shaft coupled to another shaft, it's actually you know, a socket. One other thing worth mentioning about this gearbox is it's not very precise. There's definitely some backlash between the worm and the driven gear. So you would not use this for an application where positional accuracy is really important, like robotics. But there are many applications where you would use it. So just like everything in engineering, there's a trade-off. Given all the very positive things about this gearbox, especially its compactness and its cost, you would just weigh that against what the needs are for your project and then pick your gearbox accordingly. In terms of application, this is best used uh, in intermittent applications, not something that's running all the time. Any savings you got from buying this gearbox will be wasted in energy costs later on. So efficiency does matter when things are running for long periods of time, not to mention the heat, the wear and tear, because eventually all of that friction will wear down the gear teeth and this unit will need to be replaced. The first example I can think of of an application that I use this for is right here in this very desk, which I showed you in the first video. Underneath this desk, there's a gearbox and motor exactly like this that spins the table. And I also have a speed control foot pedal 
which allows me to uh, adjust the speed so that I can weld round things as they spin on the plate. And I think that's one of the ideal applications for this. It's definitely an intermittent application. I wanted a lot of speed reduction and that's what I got. Next up, we have the planetary gear. Now we've been gradually working our way up on the price scale and planetary gears are definitely more expensive than the other gear types we've talked about so far. I wanna use this. This is not a planetary gear. This is a planetary gear, but the problem is it's kind of a black box. You can't really see what's inside. So even though I have several planetary gears here, um, none of these are really easy to take apart and, and still be useful. So we're going to use this as a proxy. This is a, a gear that kind of combines the powers of a planetary gear and a cycloidal gear. But we're going to talk about that later. The part that I want to talk to you about is this arrangement of gears here, which is similar to a planetary gear. You'll have a gear in the middle called the sun gear. These gears revolving around the outside are the planets. And if this was a planetary gear, there would be another gear called the rain gear that these rotate inside. There's a, there are internal teeth, and I'll show you a picture of what that looks like uh, on my uh, clock that I built in a previous video. But these gears will get pushed around inside of that internal ring. And it's the uniqueness of the gear teeth being turned inside and all of the gears being inside that allow for this gear to be so compact. They're also pretty precise. They might not be quite precise enough for, for robotics, but the actual backlash is relatively small. And you, this is a number that you can find whenever you're searching for gearboxes, it will often list the backlash. It might be in the radians or degrees or something like that, but that number will be available and you can convert it to whatever unit you want to know if uh, it has too much backlash for your application. The main negative for the planetary gear is that they're kind of expensive and hard to make, but they come in a huge range of options. You can see this one has a shaft on the output and the input is a receiver with a locking collar that clamps onto the shaft of your motor. All right, here's another one that same way it clamps onto the shaft of your motor, but it's got a face plate so that you can bolt things to the face instead of connecting to the shaft. And again, you have all sorts of options with uh, these gear types. This is a very common, popular gear type. So let's make sure we've covered everything. They come in a huge range of RPM and torque ratings. You can use these in both directions, whether you want to increase the speed or increase the torque, giving up speed. They're really compact and have lots of mounting options. The precision is very good, but not quite flawless. So if you need a lot of precision, I would say up to a millimeter accuracy, then you're going to be perfectly fine. If you need sub millimeter accuracy, you need to look at that backlash very carefully or consider using some than designed more specifically for robotics. And finally, the cost is pretty high. These are usually not very cheap and uh, even these small ones can be pretty expensive. Another thing worth mentioning about the planetary gear before I move on to the strain wave gear, which is probably my favorite type of gear because it's so interesting, is the fact that they can carry a very high load for their size because the stress is spread out over more material there. See all these teeth are engaged. Again, this is not a planetary gear, but because of all the extra teeth engagement, there's just more material supporting the weight and therefore uh, they can carry much higher loads. So as I mentioned earlier, they are more expensive, but the trade-off is you get higher load carrying capacity, you get smaller, more compact, you get more precision on and on, all the things we talked about. And that's why this one is so widely used and there's so many optional sizes and uh, configurations available. Well, as you can see, I've changed my mind. I've decided to try it anyway. It's for science, right? We're gonna take this guy apart and I can't get it back together. We learned something in the process. So this particular gearbox is a 10 to one gear reduction. So not as high as they can go with a planetary drive, especially when they are stacked, one set driving another set. That's actually more common in uh, drills. So. If you look at these drills behind me, if you were to take one of these guys apart, you would see there's often a planetary gear inside of here as well, and usually a stack of two. Now I'm not actually sure how to make it come apart. Okay. Nothing down there. Ooh, there's a snap ring. All right, we're committed now. We're gonna do this. Yes! This is my first time trying to take one apart. <gasps> okay. Okay. Ooh. Here we're gonna clamp onto our input shaft. 
and that's going to spin this sun gear here. And then there are the planets, and then <laughs> more screws. Let's do it. God, that ice cream truck is loud. Ah, oh, there we go. So here we have a better look at the ring gear. And you can see there's grease in there to keep everything lubricated. And then here are our planet gears, which will be uh, driven from the back with the sun that I showed you earlier. And then those are all pinned to the shaft on the output here, creating the output speed. I wish I could spin that while it's open, but maybe I can, hold on. Yeah, look at that. One of the interesting things about the planetary gear is you actually have three different forms of output. In this case, I'm holding the, I guess the equivalent of a yoke, which would make the planets stay in position. And if I, with this arrangement, if I spin the input, in this case, I'm spinning the sun gear, this would make the ring gear spin around. And so if you connected this ring gear by via a belt or some other mechanical means to spin another shaft or another whatever, then your output could be the ring gear. Or in this case, the ring gear stays in place and the output is the, the yoke connected to the planets. And we could even go the other direction. We could make the input on this side, get an increase in speed instead of an increase in torque and let the sun gear be the output. So there are all sorts of ways that you can use planets. And this is one of the reasons among several that automobile transmissions will often use a, a planetary gear because you have three types of output giving you three different speeds. The high torque version being more useful when the car is parked and the higher speed version being more useful once the car is moving. This is actually a really good place to tell you about uh, some of the tools that I use for 3D modeling as well as video editing. That brings me to my sponsor, 3D Connection. This tool is one of the most powerful tools I have on my desk. I use this thing every day and it's really hard to explain exactly why I love it so much without showing it to you. So I'm just going to pull up a model real quick. Now, I first saw one of these at my uh, first engineering job and everybody was using one of these except me. I was using a mouse to drag my model around like this and wearing my wrist out and I started to have wrist pain actually. And then I started using this thing and this is like holding the model in your hand. It's hard to explain just how intuitive this is, but it made my 3D modeling so much faster. I ended up getting their whole suite, but this is the thing that I would say you should look into. If you want, are serious about 3D modeling and you want to improve your speed, you can set up keyboard shortcuts right here on top of the keys so that you don't even have to take your hand off of it. If you need help getting started, I actually talked about how I set this up a couple of years ago, I think, <laughs> way before they were ever a sponsor. You know, I showed how I configured the buttons and how I use it with SolidWorks in order to improve my 3D modeling. Of course, it works with all CAD software. They have another model with even more keys on it, but I prefer the four big buttons. This became such an important part of my workflow. I actually bought another one just so that I could carry it around when I travel. And so I have this uh, travel version that, and there's another one like this in my shop. <laughs> so I actually have three of these face mouses. They gave me a special link that I'll put down in the description. Click on that link and the first 300 people who use that code fielding will get 10% off of their order. I think you'll love it. You should give it a shot. And now we're down to the harmonic drive or strain wave gear. This is one of the main types of gears used in robotics, although other types can be used. It's a favorite because of its high precision, basically zero backlash. And here is another one that's got a pass through in the middle to allow cables to go through. This is an important feature for robotics because you often want cables to pass through joints and be buried inside the machine, parts that are all moving. And so it would be good if you had a way to pass the cable through without it being wrapped around or tangled around the outside of the robot. But these particular gears are already inside a housing. They have bearings already embedded inside. This one has a bearing up here and it has this housing so that you can just just take this off the shelf and bolt it right onto your robot. But if you want to make a, something more custom, you would buy just the harmonic drive, which is this component here. It's actually three parts, which I have spread out on the table. So this right here will be what's called the circular spline. You can see that there are teeth on the inside for the gear. And then this is a really flexible cup called the flex spline. What makes this part so interesting is that 
it has to be torsionally stiff, like you're transmitting torque with this. So in this direction, it needs to be really strong. But what goes inside of here is this elliptical bearing, which is causing the cup to flex and move and wiggle all around like this. So it needs to be compliant in this direction, but really strong for twisting. And that to me is the most impressive part of how this works. It can be both compliant and stiff at the same time. So there is special consideration for the machining and the material that goes into making this gear. So this component would slide into here and once it's in there, oh, it will deform the cup right here into the teeth. And as you spin this with the shaft, this cup will flex pushing out into the splines here. So fully assembled, it looks like this, and the teeth will be engaged at the top and at the bottom with roughly about 30% of the teeth being engaged at any one time. And because it's being flexed into place, uh, almost stretched, if you will, and so many teeth are engaged, it's preloaded. There's no room for the teeth to wiggle around and therefore it eliminates the backlash. So here's where the magic happens. The circular spline has two more teeth than the flex spline. So as the ellipse is going around, each time a hump comes through, the gears will displace by one tooth. So every full rotation, two humps come by, you displace by two teeth. And therefore, the gear reduction will be exactly half of the number of teeth of the flex spline. So if you have 100 teeth on the flex spline, that'll be 102 on the circular spline you're gonna get a 50 to one gear reduction. This one right here has a 100 to one gear reduction. And I've got another one laying around here that's 160 to one. So that gives you an idea of just how much reduction you can get in an unbelievably tiny package. You know, multiplying the torque by 100 and the gear is only this size, that's just incredible. This last one I wanna show you is a pancake strain wave gear. These are ultra thin, by far the smallest ones that you can get. You can see how thin that is. I've just got this plate mounted to it so that I can show you uh, the gear in action. And I'm just gonna spin this with a drill. I've got another camera set up right over here. So uh, we can take a look. All right. Again, that's 160 to one. The uh, gear reduction there is just incredible. All right. It would wobble a little less if I wasn't holding it in my hand. <laughs> the only thing I haven't mentioned yet is the applications for strain wave gears. Primarily because of their cost, you would be looking to these when precision is the most important factor. For me, that was my robot arm. This is the only project I've ever used strain wave gears on, and it's in all of the joints. In fact, the one down there at the bottom has the pasture in the center of the shaft, not because I needed it, but because I was buying all of these gears used to save money, and I had to make some adjustments um, to my design in order to find everything that I needed in the used market. I was looking to industrial websites, uh, industrial auctions rather, and uh, websites like eBay to buy all of those gears. And I saved thousands of dollars that way. It's the only way I could build something this large as an individual trying to make something in my home shop and, uh, and still make it affordable. A manufacturer, of course, would buy exactly the right type of gear with the right shaft interface to match their project. So anyway, that's the whole video. If you've enjoyed this series, please give the video a thumbs up. If you have any more questions, leave them down in the comment section. There might be one more video because I haven't had a chance to talk about this guy yet, but uh, we're gonna have to save that for another day. This video is long enough. All right, thanks for watching.